When you think of a lobbyist, who do you see? Most of you immediately think of a man in a gray suit working for the bad guys, the bad industries. Sometimes even associated with corruption and bribery. Well, I'm here to tell you that I'm a woman. I'm a lobbyist, and I am actually lobbying for good. Maybe the problem is you don't see or hear as many of us as you should. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to tell you why. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself, about the girl who didn't know. So, when I was a young girl, I really wanted to travel. I wanted to meet new people. I thought I should become a diplomat. That will allow me to live that life. So, I did everything I could to finally get on that path. I studied international politics. I then studied about the European Union. I started applying to get to Brussels. The European Union was calling my name. And I made it. I arrived as an intern to the European Parliament. And I remember very clearly my first day when I arrived. I was ready. I remember what I wore. I arrived to the committee meeting, and I'm ready to take my notes. And all I hear is talking, talking, and more talking. And we all know politicians love to hear their own voice. But all of a sudden, the European Parliament was not calling my name. And I said, what to do next? I want to stay close to politics. I studied it. I want to be close to the European Union. But it's not the public sector that's going to do it for me. So as someone who wanted to stay in Brussels, I needed to find another job. I started applying again and again and again. And I landed a new internship. This time, it was at a public affairs consultancy dealing with lobbying. Public affairs consultancy dealing with lobbying. But I didn't really know what to expect. Maybe communications, public relations, something to do with Europe. Okay, I go. And I arrive the very first day, very nervous. There's a chaotic office, and I see all these Europeans all these young people speaking different languages and saying things. Hey, I'm leaving. I'm going to the European Parliament to have a coffee. Hey, I'm going to have lunch with a commissioner. Oh, this evening I'm going to this embassy to network. But what is this world I found myself in? And they're throwing words like regulation, directive, co-decision, policies. Ma, I was overwhelmed. But at the same time, I fell in love. And over 10 years later, I am now a lobbyist who goes and has coffees in the European Parliament, who meets commissioners, and who attends evenings at embassies. I negotiate on behalf of my clients with policymakers. I ensure that my clients' interests are represented in upcoming law. And just, we keep on talking about this word lobbying, but, but what does it actually really mean? What is the essence of the word? Well, when you think of lobbying, it means to influence those in power. Influence those in power. So, in a democracy, when you go and vote, you vote for policymakers that will relate in your interests, that will vote certain ways, the ways that you align with, morally, ethically. Well, if you own a business or you have a big company, you hire, get someone like me. You hire someone that understands how policymaking is made and will make sure that represents the interests of your client to policymakers. And just so that you know, I am one out of many lobbyists in Europe. There's approximately 30,000 lobbyists in Europe. They have a budget of 3 billion euro. 3 billion euro to build events, conferences, to make sure that they have the right messaging, policy papers, just to make sure that they could influence on behalf of their interests. And out of those 30,000, over 7,500 lobbyists can enter the European Parliament. That means we can enter the Parliament and have discussions, meetings with MEPs, members of the European Parliament, or any stakeholder at any time. So now you're probably wondering, Wow, okay, world of lobbying, influencing, we understand many people, important, but what do they actually tangibly talk about? Well, let me give you two examples as Europeans that you may understand. 
So you know how now you're traveling from one European country to another, and you no longer have to pay roaming charges when you make a mobile number, phone number? Well, that is thanks to European lobbying. Or how you have one uh, outlet to plug and, and to get power for all your electronic devices. It facilitates your life, right? European lobbying. But I know some of you must be thinking, okay, if it's all so positive and it's so great, then how come there is this negative connotation with lobbying? Well, of course, I take it. Like in every business, in every sector, actually, there are those who are not moral and corrupt, and there have been things in the past that shown that policymakers or business have acted in an unethical way. But I am here today to tell you that this is not the world that I live in, and it's not the world that my colleagues live in either. In fact, if anything, we see ourselves as part of the solution, not part of the corruption. Only when you bring business and government together, you could agree on policies that will actually work. Policies that will actually create that more sustainable Europe that we're talking about. So, in fact, I see myself as a translator. I take and I translate the needs of my client, and I translate it into a language that politicians will understand. And that, what the politicians think, I translate it back to what business says, to find common agreement. As I said, solution, not corruption. Moreover, I realized that, okay, I see this big sector happening and all this behind the scenes happening, it's very important. How come I didn't really know about it as a student of international studies? How come I came across it by accident because I was looking for an internship? Well, it's because it's not talked about. It's because there is this negativity about it, and people are scared to say the word lobbying. You know, when you have children and you ask them, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Many can say, I would like to be a lawyer, or maybe someone will say, oh, a doctor, an engineer, or maybe, just maybe, one of those bold ones will say, I will be president. You don't have a child saying, well, I will be a lobbyist when I grow up. <laughs> Why? Is it because there is this negative connotation that if you are a lobbyist, you're corrupt? Is it because it's considered a job without a purpose? Well, I'm here to tell you that it does have a purpose. And moreover, with these negative connotations to it, I realized over the years that still when I go to conferences or events with lobbying, it's predominantly men, much more men than women. In fact, to this day, I sometimes enter a conference and it's fully men. And sometimes they're discussing policies that only impact women. So I started thinking a little bit more. Well, how come? Why is it like that? Look, could it be the studies? What kind of studies does it take to be a lobbyist? OK, you study law, political science, economy, international politics. But just as many women enroll in these kinds of studies as men, could it be a special skill set that you need? Well, to be a successful lobbyist, what do you need to do? You need to be able to communicate, articulate, build relations, trust. If anything, a lot of women have these inherited skills already of being able to build consensus. So it wasn't really gender-related. Skills like these you acquire through time, expertise, knowledge. So, if it's not the studies, nor the skills, what could it be? Well, unfortunately, to this day, many organizations still prefer to hire men over women. There is this effect, it's called the mirror effect, that I will hire someone similar to me because I'm convinced they're going to do a better job. So, as we know that in Europe, there continues to be more male politicians than women politicians. In lobbying, it makes sense. More male politicians, an organization will hire someone that looks physically in a mirror, like the person they're trying to lobby, because they think that because they have the same, maybe, features, same background, physically look the same, they will be more successful at convincing them to act in a certain way. Actually, according to a European Parliament report on gender and politics from last year, 
It says that in Brussels, in the European Union, specifically in the Parliament, European Parliament, 60% of parliamentarians are men. 40%, just under 38, are women. If you apply the mirror effect, 60% lobbyists are men, 40% approximately lobbyists are women. What's more alarming, though, is at national level, at European countries. There, according to the same report from the parliament, an average 30% are women parliamentarians. 30% average, so that means in Scandinavia, it's a little bit higher, but in many southern or eastern European countries, unfortunately, there's not a lot of women parliamentarians. So, applying the mirror effect nationally, there are less women lobbyists than, than men. I studied this European Parliament report a little bit more, and they go on and list reasons why they think that is the case. One of the reasons that they list is that there is still a lack of female role models in politics and policy-related jobs. I started thinking, how can I change this? What, what, what can I do? Well, naturally, I can become a role model. I can spread light about the work that I'm doing to show that lobbying, there's nothing corrupt about it, that it's actually a necessary part of policy making. And actually, more women should know about it, and it should be something that they strive to become, if that is what they would want. So I started thinking, to become a role model, well, what do I need to do? I need to connect with some girls, I need to have a platform to speak on. So I decided to look for an organization that dealt with mentoring, and I became a mentor. This group organized uh, different mentorship programs for women who are looking for international careers. So I specifically got in contact with them and said, OK, let's bring a girl to Brussels. Let her become a lobbyist and follow me for a few days. We developed a program, we came up with a campaign, we raised money to make this happen for this young girl. And we just put together a great program, and in the spring, my mentee came to Brussels and followed me around, and we had meetings at the European Parliament, at the Commission. She was putting together position papers. She understood how policymaking was becoming. And for this girl from a small town, who seemed that coming to Brussels or this European Union was so abstract, became possible. All of a sudden, she realized that hey, if I want a job in Brussels and I want to influence the European Union, I can. So I'm urging you to do the same, to look around you. Maybe already in the company that you work for, there is a mentorship program. Take a look. If not in your company, maybe in your social circles, in your community, there is an organization that is dealing with bringing women, small women, young women and older women together. Or maybe there's an online platform, like I looked at an online platform I found and I connected. And once you identify your platform, your connection, engage. But take the time, take the time to invite this girl to the next meeting you go to or have her follow you for a couple of days so she sees how it is, speak to her, tell her the difficulties you've had, the good things that you've accomplished, have a conversation. And if now you're thinking, well, that's not really my reality, simply invite someone to have lunch with you, or a coffee. Share your story, because you never know that one conversation might spark something new in the mind of this young girl. Now, let me go back and tell you more about my mentee, Olga, the girl who now knows. So as opposed to me, the girl who didn't know, Olga knows that she could become a lobbyist. She knows that Brussels, it's just around the corner and that the door is open for her. She knows how to pick up the phone and call a commission official, and it's not hard, and it's not far away from her. So in this last year of becoming a mentor, I realized that my journey my story inspired a young woman to a career she didn't even know existed. To me, this was priceless. And I think we need more of these stories. We need more of these connections. Just a couple of weeks ago, the European Union just passed a new law. This law says that by 2026, 
40% of European companies' boards need to be filled with women. It took 10 years to pass this law since it was proposed. 10 years for 40%, not 50%, 40% in four years' time. So I'm here to lobby you, lobby you right now to act. We could continue sitting around and complaining about the gender gap and the problems. Or we could be part of the change. We can start connecting and opening up those doors. Those doors that maybe for us were not so open. Or doors, like in my case, we didn't even know existed. Thank you. <laughs>